It is just a huge, huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing a legend. Um, this all started when we did a podcast interview with Emily Latron, who wrote an amazing book, um, you know, coming out of the Vietnam War and coming away in America and rising all the way to the top. And she credits you of just being her rock star, her idol, her mentor, her everything. And I want to read your bio because it's uh, too good to be true. It almost <laughs> sounds like science fiction. <laughs> Sharon Lecter is an entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, international speaker, licensed CPA, and chartered global management accountant. A lifelong education advocate, she is the founder and CEO of Pay Your Family First, a financial education organization and chief abundance officer for EBW 2020, an organization dedicated to empowering a billion women by 2020. That is so cool. Sharon has combined her expertise as a CPA and an international best-selling author with her unmatched passion for financial literacy and entrepreneurship to inspire change for individuals and business across the globe for over 30 years. Credited as the genius behind the Rich Dad brand, Sharon is currently partnered with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. As a driving force behind these two mega brands, Sharon has demonstrated her entrepreneurial vision and business expertise while empowering audience with messages of hope and prosperity. Sharon is also the author of the best-selling books Think and Grow Rich for Women, Outwitting the Devil, Three Feet from Gold, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. For her unparalleled commitment to community and professional excellence, Sharon was honored as the 2015 Financial Educator of the Year's Honor from the National Financial Education Educators Council. Her financial mastery college curriculum also received the Excellence in Financial Literacy Education Award for 2015 Book of the Year from the Institute for, for Financial Literacy. Sharon lives each day in pursuit of and to inspire others to achieve a life of success and significance, and all I can say to that is wow. And unfortunately <laughs> today, you're talking to probably 8,000 dentists who their weakest spot is basically financial literacy and entrepreneurship. I mean, Sharon, they went to eight years of school and they got A's in calculus and physics and chemistry and geology and root canals and fillings and crowns. And then three minutes after they graduate, they're supposed to be in charge of payroll, advertising, leading a staff, HR, and it's just bizarre how our entire education had nothing to do with owning a dental office. What would and, and another thing I want to say to you is that when I was little, it was an all male profession, and now all the dental school schools are half women, yeah. and these women are coming out and they need role models like you because a lot of them are, are graduating, and all the role models in dentistry are a bunch of old, fat, white, bald guys, <laughs> and uh, and I'm so glad that they get to hear from Emily and now you. What do you? Thank you so much. So we do have a shorter introduction. It just means I've been around a long time. So, <laughs> but it re really is, and it's not just dentists. It's most professionals. You are the experts in what you do, but nobody taught you how to build the business around what you do. And that's one of my missions in life is to provide that and understand that you know be the expert in what you what you are doing but let's make sure we hire the people that we need to to make sure the business is sound and solid and, and running appropriately and part of that is also making sure as the driving force of the business that you know what they're doing and you understand the numbers so it's a huge issue and i know that you're doing a lot to provide that kind of expertise and education so i really want to applaud your efforts because it's something that businesses fail and there's been lots of different stats and stuff that, you know 74 percent of businesses in parts of the country parts of the world fail because of the lack of financial literacy and financial understanding we hear you know it's just an issue that is pervasive in all practices but certainly when you're talking about professional offices where you're the kingpin or the queen pin um, you need to have that foundation that's going to support you you know, Sharon, it looks like from the data I have that, you know, podcast, only five and a half percent of Americans have ever listened to a podcast. And whenever, and all the data I'm seeing this show is they're all 30 and under. So, so talk to this woman. She just graduated from dental school. How does she get from A to Z? Where does she start? What does she read? Do you, do you, would you recommend your books? Do you want to go through each book and, and uh, why they should uh, read that or, you know, well, Provide some type of, of, of path for this journey. Well, certainly, you know, a lot of it is mindset. I'm going to start with just saying, what did your parents say about money when you were young? Typically, your parents said, money doesn't grow on trees. We need to pinch our pennies. We can't afford it. 
Um, who do you, for us old guys, who do you think we are, the Rockefellers? Um, and so all of those things have one thing in common, they're negative. And so as a child, we get this negative imprint about money and we don't even know that that's happening. But it, all of a sudden we're afraid we're not gonna make enough money. Then we're afraid when we become successful, we're afraid we're gonna lose it. And so when, part of it is getting your mindset right to understand that. And so you're graduating from college with this incredible degree, dental school, and you're gonna go out there and you're a young professional. Make sure you reach out for support and get those mentors that you were just talking about to make sure that you're getting the expertise that you need on your team. What happens? in school and certainly in dental school you you're taught you have to do everything yourself precision right with precision but in business business is a team team sport and so as leader of your team you need to make sure you have the right people that can do that foundational work to support you so that you can do what you're the expert in so Sharon you talk a lot about pay yourself first um, uh, so many dentists all along the way they, they never know, well, should I buy a new $100,000 thing for my office or should I start putting money in savings? A lot of people, it seems like when I talk to when they're, especially when they're under 30, um, they, they, they see retiring at 65 as like being, you know, earth invaded by Martians. They, they're, they're never going to live, you know, they just, just too. So how, how, do you, how do you help make that decision between investing in my business for getting it poised for growth versus savings or, or debt reduction? Well, I think from a standpoint of particularly, let's talk first about, did you graduate with dental school with a lot of school debt? So actually you're starting your career. I talk about a school debt being a mortgage without the house. And, 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 so, there, and your, your audience right now graduated with about 350,000 in debt. Yeah, so that's a huge issue for you. And part of it is understanding you're gonna come out, you're gonna start making money. Um, how do you allocate what you're making first? make sure you're making life decisions that support you having extra money to pay down that debt and to start putting money away. I mean, if you can start just having a small amount every month going into an investment account, you know, you want to have, certainly you want to have three to six months worth of savings, but for young people, you know, for, for us old guys, I don't necessarily think this automatic reduction works but for young people I think it does if you're if you're actually working for someone else and you're an employee have it, have it just go away before you see it so you can't spend it and go into an investment account but it's most important for people to understand that you do have that huge debt and so maintain your living expenses to the point where you have that money that you can start whittling away at that debt and investing and when you look at starting your own practice you know, you may get another loan for your practice because you have to buy all that equipment. And so you, you're now building this tower of debt that you need to start focusing on and figuring out how can I expand my revenue to in order to afford paying the, the debt on those um, items and still have the money to pay for my employees and to pay for my living expenses and to put a little away for retirement. And sometimes it's a daunting issue. And so it's important to find people like, like you to support them and understanding how you did it successfully so that they can emulate what you did. So Sharon, um, you wrote uh, the book, Think and Grow Rich for Women. So I just want to play devil's advocate uh, being a man. What, what's really, um, by the way, Think and Grow Rich uh, um, is just an amazing book. Uh, I, I loved it. Uh, but how is 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 there unique things for women versus men in uh, business today in America in 2016? Well, I love that question. Thank you for asking it. If you actually, the first line in the book when you open it is why a book for women. Um, and I will tell you most of my career, I actually resisted writing anything for women because I felt I had, I fought my way through the, 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 the system and uh, being the only woman in many cases in my career. And I felt the steps to success were the same for men and women. And I still believe that today. The, the issue is Think and Grow Rich, which is an incredible book and still as valid today as when it was released in 1937, was written by Napoleon Hill at a time when there were no women in business. And so he, he talked to the most six, 500 of the most successful people, men in the globe, and um, his spent 20 years synthesizing success. That's why the book is still as valid today as it was back then. And I wanted to honor him 
but certainly what's happened, you just made the comment, over 50% of the dental school now are women. Um, we have women rising up, and I got really kind of frustrated with the women that were being so negative and complaining and criticizing the men who's getting their way. I said, we need to change the dialogue from criticizing and complaining to one of celebrating the progress that women have made. So Think and Grow Rich for Women actually honors Napoleon Hill, each cha the same chapter format as what's in the original Think and Grow Rich book. And I start each chapter with a synopsis of his original content. And then I talk, um, interview several women who have used that concept in their own pathway to success. Then I talk about how I've used that, used that in my career. Then I have what I call a sisterhood mastermind, which are quotes from women from history, politics, globally, um, to support that concept. And it really is for women to be able to relate to other women and see how they've used those steps to success in their own career. And the, the steps are the same for men and women, but we tend to approach them a little differently. And that's what I wanted to bring in to, as a support tool for other women and to change that dialogue from one of criticizing and complaining. I love men, I work with men, I love working with men, um, to one of celebrating those men that support us and celebrating the accomplishments that women have made and the opportunities that are right before us. So get rid of that negative dialogue and let's be positive. Sometimes when I'm at a dental convention, uh, you know, these women, dentists make big money and their husband makes a lot less and they'll say to me, uh, you know, I kind of feel emancipated that, uh, emasculated that I uh, make less than my money and make less money than my wife. And I always say, just try not to think about it while you're vacuuming. <laughs> Absolutely. Was that the right advice? And you know, and that percentage is growing every year. I mean, I don't even have the most recent stat, but it was like 38% a couple of years ago of households where women are making more than the men. And, and so that, that's a natural state of things. And it does change the dynamic in the traditional sense in a marriage. And so it's a little less of an issue for that younger generation. But for those of us that are, um, you know, not in that Gen Y millennial age, um, it has been, it's an issue in marriages. Money is the number one issue, you know, cause for divorce in most stats. And most of it is arguing over money or lying to each other about money. Yeah, I, uh, I can't believe it. I even hear, you know, I got four boys, uh, 21 to 27. I hear them and their friends saying that they just, they just, that would not be cool if your wife made more than you. And I, I don't get it. I'm like, are you crazy? I would love to have a wife that made 10 times more money than me. Um, I, I wouldn't trade my cat. I mean, I don't want it that bad. I'm not going to get rid of my cats. But uh, Well, don't, um, for don't forget they've grown up in a household with a very strong father. And so that's what they know. And that's what they want, want to be when, they're, when, they're, when they have their own household. So that may, you know, it may just be their respect for you that's giving them that thought process. So, Emily, um, at the end of World War II, the average American woman was having five and a half kids. Now it's down to uh, 2.4. But if you back out the uh, first-generation immigrants, it's, it's under two. Japan's women is under nine. Is part of the future of successful women much smaller families? Um, I, I read 27% of baby boomer women, women didn't even have a child. Are families going to get smaller as careers get bigger? Well, I think it's already happening, and I think you know the women are waiting till later in life to have children. Um, certainly, women that are, are upwardly mobile in their careers many times are are putting having children off later. And yes, I think it's a natural dynamic, and it's going to change a lot about our family structure. And certainly, you know, as they become um, less and less of the higher income families having those children, you're going to end up having a um, an issue where we've got to make sure that all children, and that's not just, the, all children need to be, be educated about money because that's what really le levels the playing field. Financial education levels the playing field between rich and poor kids. <clears throat> Today, we've heard the comment, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Well, that's true because that's where they learn about money at home. They don't learn that in school, which is something I'm trying to change. And if we can teach our kids about money, it doesn't matter whether you're a dentist or a CEO or a janitor, we all have to deal with money. Money's a life skill. And it's actually a, it's criminal that we're not teaching kids about money because that's what opens the greatest world of opportunity for young people. You know, my father, um, 
never I, I can I have zero memories of him throwing me a baseball, a frisbee, take me to a park, a bicycle, whatever. But he took me to all every bank, bankers meeting when he went to buy ads on uh, K A K E. Took me with him, and we'd walk in there. He'd say, "No, nah, I don't want to hear a word from you. Just shut up. Just sit in the room and listen." This is the stuff that's going to make you be able to afford a cup of coffee someday, not throwing a Frisbee in the park. And he took me to every business thing he ever did. And in fact, I, um, I remember so many times we'd be at like an IHOP and I would just lay down on the, the bench because they would, they, the conversation would go to one o'clock in the morning and I, I'd, I'd eventually just pass out. But he just <laughs> insisted uh, that I needed to be where the business was being discussed and talked and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, just, just an amazing deal. Um, what was um, your book, Outwitting the Devil? What was I, the I love it. Thank you for asking. Well, we just t- talked about Think and Grow Rich, the original book that came out in '37. Well, Napoleon Hill, who had w- worked on it for over 20 years when he released it in 1937, was frustrated. He said, even though no- people know what they're supposed to do to become successful, they don't do it. And I bet that hits home for a few people watching or listening to this podcast. Um, and certainly for me, you know, we, sometimes we inertia, we can't get off the sofa. We know we're supposed to do something, but we don't do it. Well, he was so frustrated that he sat down and a few months wrote Outwitting the Devil. But his wife was so afraid of the title, she forbid it to be published. And it was hidden for 73 years. So my first book with the foundation was called Three Feet from Gold. And the month that we were publishing that, Um, Don Green, the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, reached out to me and said, Sharon, I've got this manuscript. I'm not quite sure what to do with it. I want you to read it. So so he sent it to me. And within a few short hours, um, it was just amazing. I said, this has got to get out. And I really think there was a greater power at work for why it wasn't released back in in the 30s, because it is the right message for today. Outwitting the Devil is about how we allow fear fear of poverty, fear of success, fear of criticism, all kinds of fears to keep us from realizing the success that we all richly deserve. And certainly helps identify maybe where some of that fear came from as young people, whether it was our religious upbringing or whether it was our educational upbringing or what happened at home, identifying where it was so that we can get rid of it and release it. And then the book talks about seven steps that you can take to get rid of that fear. And I'm so thrilled because one of the things that really excited me to be working with the foundation was to bring the messages of Napoleon Hill to that younger generation, those 30-year-olds you're talking about, um, because most of them didn't even know who Napoleon Hill was. And with what's happened in the economy in 07 and 08, um, we needed to bring back those core principles of Napoleon Hill to that younger generation. And and this book is doing it, I'm proud to say. It's a little irreverent, it's a little in your face, but it's, it's really transforming people's thought processes about not being a victim, not laying blame and justifying, but taking responsibility and stepping into your own power. So I absolutely highly recommend it. My role in it was I did some precision editing, but it's totally his content. And then I add, add sections that really relate and show the difference between when he wrote it in 38 and today. Today, And for those hardcore Napoleon Hill fans, they can read the book and skip over my comments. But the book was truly designed and written and released for helping people who weren't familiar with him today, yet younger generation, to start realizing that there's a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of education found in books still and we need to go back to the messages of napoleon hill and now um it's amazing i, I you know there's uh you know it's easy to look in america to realize there's you know half boys half girls it's easy to recognize that there's you know irish mexicans japanese um but it's hardest to see how they the the difference in thinkers between the greatest generation the baby boomers the millennials and um, Amazon's data is showing that those uh, those younger kids that they, they only do audiobooks. They they we would sit in a chair and read, and they just got to multitask. They want to hear the audiobook right. while they're on the treadmill or doing dishes or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, audiobooks. So rich dad, poor dad. Um, uh, you know, I got a library here of a thousand books. That that was one of the books that uh, all four of my boys talked about the most. That was just that was a mon- monster book. I mean, that was just. <laughs> I mean, it's still a monster brand, like like you say. I mean, t- talk about your journey with that book. 
Sure, sure. Well, it actually starts back in um, 92 when my oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. And that he came home in December of his freshman, first semester of his freshman college. And he said, I'm, you know, I need your help. Will you bail me out? And we said, of course not. But I was so angry with him. <laughs> I was more angry with myself. <laughs> yes. I said, no. The best thing I've you ever didn't even blink always. on that. You yeah, I don't always say the right thing, but that time it was. It took him seven years to get out of debt and seven years to repair his credit. But he's as passionate about teaching people about money today as I am. But that was December of 1992, and that's really when I dedicated the rest of my professional career to financial education and financial literacy. So you fast forward a few years, and this guy went to see my husband. My husband, Michael Lecter, is well known as an intellectual property attorney internationally. And this guy walked in with this little rolled up piece of freezer paper and his flip flops and his Hawaiian shirt, and he had this idea for a board game. And um, my husband called me and you know introduced us because I had built the talking book industry, kids books that have sound strips down on the side and the game industry. So I had some experience, but I really loved the game. It was called Cash Flow. It's Robert Kiyosaki. And that's where I, when I met him and the concept that he wanted to put in the game was perfect. And so I wanted to support him in creating that. And along the process, you know, he wanted to charge $200 for the game. And I said, I think if that's the case, we probably need to have something a little less expensive that kind of shares our philosophy, what we want people to learn. So we actually, and this most people don't know this, is we wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad as a brochure for the board game. And um, we thought our, our company name was Cashflow Technologies. We thought that was our brand. And the world said, no, 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 your brand is Rich Dad, because we wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad with no plan to write any other books. Well, then we had a plan, well, we'll do a trilogy. We'll do Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, Rich Dad's Guide to Investing. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, no. So we, we wrote 15 books together over the 10 years, and then we created the brand Rich Dad Advisors. So we became a large publishing empire on our own. But the messages of Rich Dad, Poor Dad exploded. I really believe it was one of the first true viral successes before the internet, because back then you still had to share own shelf space in the stores. But um, it wasn't because of us. It was because it was the right message at the right time. And people like your boys read it and talked about it. And other people started reading it. And it really helped change, again, that mindset about money, understanding that most of us are trained that we are our only asset. We got to get out of bed, go to work, get a paycheck and come home. And Rich Dad Poor Dad opens up our mind and realizes that our financial statement, our balance sheet is our personal business. And the more assets we can generate and create and buy, the more financially free we will be. And that simple concept is just not taught in school. Of either, uh actively working for your money, being employed or self-employed versus passively making uh, money work for you as, an, as uh, a big business or an investor. Absolutely. Because if you think about the cash flow quadrant, it's a literally it's a quadrant in four segments. And on the left side, you are an employee or self-employed, exactly what you just talked about. So as a dentist, you are self-employed, you're self-employed, you're an expert. So you, are, you could be working um, based on your hourly rate, you to bill hourly. But when you create your practice, you're creating a business if, you're, if you have other dentists. Okay, a business, a big business is where you are employing systems and people to make money for you. As an investor, your assets are invested to generate money for you. And so you look at where your income is coming. I still get income from all four quadrants. But I want to focus my income on that right side of the equation. So, for instance, um, Emily in her practice, she has other dentists that work with her. She has a second office. Those things, that's how she starts expanding and building her business around her expertise. So your expertise is one thing, but building your business around that is the second way of making money. Yes, I always tell the story of when I got to uh, got out of dental school in 87 in Kansas City, moved to Phoenix, and um, I met this uh, 87-year-old female dentist, and um, her, uh, she, she was Jewish and escaped Nazi Germany. Germany. She knew uh, the writing on the walls. She came here. They didn't recognize her degree. 
Um, so um, she went to a lawyer, and they said, no, you, you can't be a licensed dentist, but you can own a practice. So she was forced. She couldn't be employed or self-employed. So she was forced. She sa he said, well, you can't own a dental office. So she, so she bought a dental office and had people work for her. By the time I met her, she had four offices, north, south, east, west. She, as they were each doing about two and a half million a year. And I thought to myself, you know, she was all, you know, every day checking her four offices. And I thought, you know, that when life serves you lemons, I mean, she made lemonade and she was on top of the world, still having a blast when I met her in her, in her late 80s. And well, I just that, thought, and that's, yeah, that's called working on your business, not in your business. And most of us, particularly, we, we spend so much time working in our business that we forget to create that strategy and work on our business and know how to create that asset. Because having other dentists working for you are, is an asset for you because they're generating the money and you're getting a percentage of it. So That is just a, so, so you wrote that book with Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, I started the company um, with Robert. We were partners. We were partners for 10 years. Um, we built the company um, during that 10-year process. We wrote 15 books together. We went globally, internationally, um, and it was a huge success. But in 2007, I was no longer aligned with what he wanted to do. He wanted to start a franchising operation, and I didn't believe in it. So I made the decision to leave. And that's when um, sometimes you have to close one door for other doors to open. And that's when I was asked by President Bush to be on the President's Advisory Council. So I always tell people, you know, what are you doing right now in your life that maybe you need to stop doing? Close that door so other doors of opportunity will open for you. And, and how was that franchise venture for him? Um, it, well, he's, it, it was not successful because no. it wasn't the right process for the franchisee. It, may, it would have made us a lot of money but it wasn't the right uh, formula. So um, that it didn't last for more than a couple of years after I left. But then, you know, the, the whole issue is, you know, I am very proud of the rich dad messaging because a lot of it is from what things that I learned from my father. My father was career Navy. He didn't have formal education past the third grade, but he went on to literally train and run the engineering school for the Navy and um, totally self-made. And, and while I grew up, we had, orange groves, we had rental properties, we always had multiple businesses going on. So a lot of my, my basic philosophy was things that I learned as I grew up that were just innate. Entrepreneurship was just part of the way I lived. Sharon, I'm, I'm not making this up. The, the, the facts are, we, we both live here in Arizona. You, you live where? Paradise Valley? Paradise or, Valley, yep. And I'm down here uh, where the poor people live in Ahwatukee. And oh, uh, Tukey's beautiful. What are you I talking know, about? It's gorgeous. I know. I love it. I'm right across the street from South Mountain. I love that mountain. But the Arizona State Dental Association had a um, a meeting um, for women's issues in dentistry. So you know they they don't have them for you know old fat bald guys in dentistry. They don't have them for you know Chinese dentists. But they 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 have them for they have them for women's uh, issues. Um, the thing that disturbs me is sometimes uh, young dentists tell me. Uh, young female dentists tell me that they still feel it's a man's dentistry is a man's profession. They tell me when they go to the study club that there, you know, there's, there's 28 people and there's only like two girls in there, and it kind of makes them uh, shy or you know um, less engaged. What advice would you give them? That they're listening to the wrong people, and they're looking at through negative glasses as opposed to positive glasses. If you're one of two people in a room that are women. Look at that as an opportunity, a way to stand apart and stand, you know, and represent women in dentistry. You know, again, it's, it's what we put in our mind. And that's the whole purpose. I, I tell them to read, think, and grow rich for women. Because what happens is we've been programmed by all this media to complain, you know, and say there's not enough women. Well, th there are more and more women um, in every field. And so, as you say, over 50% of the women are in dentistry school. That we're, You're not at 50% ownership of practices yet, but you'll get there because we're, the, the, the momentum is growing. But do it with grace and, and stand tall and be proud of who you are and what you're doing. And I think part of that mindset is, what's hap is why we need organizations like what you just talked about, because women have been taught that they're not worthy. Women have been taught that they're second class, and that that needs to change. And I, I, you know, I was I was very grateful. I grew up in a home that I was told anything's a limit. I can do or be anything I want to be, um, and that's is, is something that women tend to put themselves last. 
And so they don't grab an opportunity. They let others. And so that's the kind of thing that women need to focus on and change. And the women that are saying that to you, give them a book, give them Think and Grow Rich for Women. I'll, you know, but, and that's not a promotional message, but again, it's... No, I want to promote it. I'm going to promote yeah, it. It's what they're thinking that's the problem. They're, they're assuming that they, that they don't have a right to be there. Just because should, should we should we that. name this podcast Think and Grow? Let's name it Think and Grow Rich for Women, sure. and then uh, and then we'll put a big and it's available on Amazon, I assume. Yes, of course. And then after they, you want them to read that book first, and then what would be the second book? Outwitting the Devil, then Three Absol- Feet from Gold, then Rich yes. Dad Poor Dad. Absolutely, yeah. Outwitting the Devil is good because it helps women address the fear in their lives. So yes, Think and Grow Rich for Women, Outwitting the Devil, um, Three Feet from Gold. Is probably not. I would say rich dad, poor dad, and then three feet from gold. Jen, I want to. I'm sorry from the audience for beating this issue over a dead uh, um, uh, horse, but um, I just keep always hearing this all the time. We, we just had our annual meeting in Las Vegas, our 14th annual uh, county meeting, and I still have young women dentists. Has. They say, "I'm a woman dentist. I graduate. I work for the old man, and uh, he manages staff like this. And then he sold it to me and left, and I managed just like he did." But they don't listen to me. Um, it's different because I'm a woman and he's a man. Is that is that real or is that just in their head? Um, it's in their head because what's the, the issue is whether he was there or they were there. The people that you're managing have changed. They're younger. I, I do that. I talk a lot. In fact, I worked with Emily on this in her practice because. You're the younger generation coming up. You can't manage them the way that you managed people 10 years ago. It's very different. So it doesn't matter whether you're a man, woman, young or old. Um, If you don't understand how to manage that younger generation, you might as put a a revolving door in the front of your office because they're going to come and go. And so I worked on that with Emily as well. I'm happy to speak to anybody that you have that you want me to, to related to that because managing that Gen Y in 2025, 75% of our workforce are millennials or younger, 75%. So if you're not paying attention to how you do things and making sure that you're adjusting based on current trends, then you are gonna have a problem, whether you're a man or a woman. And so they're, they're assigning the wrong blame to their issue. If, if they're taking the old guy's management techniques and they're not getting listened to, it's because they're, they're not doing it from a point of authenticity. You know, have a room, have a code of conduct, establish, um, you know, make p- younger generation, they want to feel like they own their job. Allow them to have that feel of contribution and many times they have these archaic laws, um, rules related to the workplace that need to change based on Gen Y. So um, the service you offered, uh, Emily Latron, what service do you, are you offering to our listeners right now and how would they contact you? What, what, what do you provide? Well, I have several different programs. Emily is one of my master mentors. I have a high-level mentoring program that I do to support people growing their businesses, getting their businesses to the next level, fine-tuning their systems, make sure you have the foundations in place. And you can write me at info at SharonLector.com if you want additional information. But we also, I also speak a lot. If you have an, an association group, I'd be happy to come talk to them about this very topic because it's, it's important to understand the mindset of the people you're managing. And you know, if, if this younger generations feel like they're being dictated to, they rebel, uh, plain and simple. If they feel like you've actually talked, you know, gone through the policies, the biggest issue, and particularly for women, we want to manage people, and that's when we get in trouble. The issue is managing systems. So if you have systems on how you want your office to operate, and you, you clearly define those systems and your team understands those systems, then when you have an issue, you manage to the system. That's just a small piece of what I teach. It takes the emotion out of it. It takes the emotion as a manager talking to somebody else. It also takes emotion out of them. You say, okay, well, let's look at this. This is the way we want this to run. Um, you know, and what went wrong? You know, what went wrong with the system? Not you did something wrong. I don't like the way you're te- teaching our customers. You know, you need to be treating them with respect. Well, is that in your code of conduct? Is that in your written system? 
So then you can actually manage systems as opposed to managing emotions. And what um what um book did you get the the um, book of the year award? Which specific book was that? Well, I have a college curriculum called Your Money Mastery, Your Financial Mastery. It's right here. Um, and it was created, All Things Money, and it is um, a college curriculum. It's actually an adult financial literacy curriculum. We're using it in colleges. We also are using a form of this in the EBW 2020 company that I now own a piece of, Empowering a Billion Women by 2020. We're creating a money school there, another place for your female dentists to come and join us. Um, EBW 2020 stands for Empowering a Billion Women by 2020. And in it, we talk about how to build your business. It's gonna, it's not just a educational platform. It actually, we have tools to help you analyze your business tools to plug in on the accounting side. And we just want to support women globally in building their businesses. So that's something I'm creating a money school for, for that website as well. But the, all of this is really, I, I had the honor of being asked to be a national spokesperson for the AICPA, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and because that's how I started my career. And I talk about the power of association. This is a perfect example of it. But each and every one of those women may not have their, their associations in order. They may not be out there, um, number one, marketing their business or be being getting the right kind of support from other women or other men. You know, let the men support you. We, this is a team effort. And it's important to have the resources that you need and the right mentors. Sharon, what would you say? This is a, a, a plague of a problem with me, not just for women but men. But, you know, you ask them any technical question – about their their trade, dentistry, bond strengths, wear rates, all these things. They just they just know the answer. They just blurt it out of their head or whatever. And then you ask him any number on any financial number. What percent of your overhead is labor? What is supplies? What is you know any number? And they look at you like a deer staring into headlights. What would you say to these women who spend all their time learning about? bond strengths and root canals and can't even tell you what their profit margin is on any procedure that they do. They don't even know what they're doing. They're doing, they're passionate about procedures that they've lost money on every single time they've ever done the procedure for a decade and don't even know it. And if it wasn't for root canals or crowns making such excess margins to cover their losses in all the other areas, they'd be bankrupt and they don't even know it. How do you, how do you get them to focus uh, you're a CPA background. How do you get them to be a miniature CPA? Well, first, I, and it's not just the women dentists out there. There's right. quite a few men dentists who don't understand those. All of them. Either. <laughs> it's all dentists, physicians, and lawyers. And that's what scares that's me about right. our government. I, you said you were with the yeah. Bush administration. Dentists, every, lawyers, yes, absolutely. And, and the Congress is all lawyers. Yeah. They, they, they weren't trained in business. No, they don't have a clue. And that's, that's the problem. The first thing is acknowledging it. You don't have a clue. And then and the second step is to get yourself enough, educated enough to understand what the, those terminology, what, what, just what the vocabulary, what you just said, that's why they glaze over. They don't even understand the vocabulary of money. But the other thing is you don't have, if you're focusing on building your practice, you may not have the time to educate yourself on, well, you don't, on all things money. But bring in the right people to support you that will educate you on what you need to understand, how to read a financial statement, how to understand cost of goods service, cost of goods sold, how to understand cost per procedure, how to understand medical reimbursements versus you know how walk-in clients. You need to understand all of those elements and how to analyze it. You don't need to generate the numbers, but you need to have the right people generating the numbers for you so that you know that they're reliable and accurate. And the best way to do that is find somebody, the most successful dentist in your field, and ask who they use. Get their references. Understand what they're doing so that you can emulate them. Because it's, at the end of the day, the buck stops with the owner. And if you don't know how to read your financial statements – you know, you're on a collision course, most likely. You need to understand your financial statements. You need to understand the analysis, understand those ratios. And you've got to start somewhere. So you focus on what you know best, but get somebody in there that can take your information 
analyze it, go over it with you and educate you so that you can then start looking at trends in your business and look at your, your business for the last three years. Figure out what those trends are. It might identify something very quickly that you're doing wrong or that you need to tighten up. Sharon, you started the um, you started this podcast talking about you know so much of this what we learned about money we we learn at home from our mom and you know um, money doesn't grow on trees. Um, one of the other huge problems I see in all these dental offices is when when we were little you couldn't just ask your uncle, hey uncle, how much money do you make at work? You know what do you get paid an hour? It just it's a private issue. And when I walk in these dental offices, I ask the staff, you know, what do we have to do to break even today? That the they they have no idea that these dentists. Um, think that all that stuff is private and they're the only ones that see the cards and their team has no idea what's going on. How would you coach someone to sit there and say, if, if you got to be transparent, you know, you manage with numbers, uh, turn this stuff over to the staff. And I, I don't, you know, how do you get over that cultural barrier? Well, I think it's one step at a time. One is, a, is really identifying it because a lot of times they're in their own little cloud. They don't even realize they're doing it. Um, one of the things we talked with Emily about is um, not only having this code of conduct, but also allowing the, the staff to participate in the customer service and getting a bonus as a relative and understanding where the costs are and how they can manage those costs. And, you know, and more importantly, you know, while the cat's away, the mice will play, you know, how, how they can be held accountable when maybe mom isn't there. And so, again, all of these procedures are in that system that you establish and you talk to them, you let them know it. they are part of the team, allow them to invest in the process. But again, get accurate accounting, accurate information that you can share with your team. You don't need to share profit and loss, but you can share, this is what we're getting for this procedure. This is what it costs us. And this is how we can reduce our cost. Because obviously maybe if it's an insurance reimbursement, you can't increase how much you're getting from the insurance, but you need to manage the costs. And then your, your staff will feel like they can participate. And, and it's part of that savings, give them part of the savings, allow them to feel like they're actually generating additional revenue for you and they're gonna get a bonus as a result. So sure, do you think there's any economic changes today affecting entrepreneurship, business, small business? Well, it's never been a better time to start your own business. Um, the day of safe, secure job is long gone. Um, and certainly when we look at what's happening with the economy, you and I can't control maybe the international economy, maybe not, we can't control the U.S. economy or our local economy, but we can control our own wallets. And when it comes to money, um, I, I say this is kind of trite, but it's true, you're either a master of money or a slave to it. And when you are owning your own business, you can become a master of your money if you manage your business properly. And the buck stops with you, but you also have the control to create your future. When you're an employee, you, you, you serve at the pleasure of your employer. And so while it might feel safe and secure, you're at any moment that safe, secure can go to unemployed. And if you own a business and you're managing it properly, it's, a, it's not just an asset for you, but it's for generations to come if you build it properly. And so it, there's never been a better time, certainly with what's happened in the economy, 07, 08. We look at the stock market, even the first couple of months of this year. You know, we, we have to stand in control of our own financial destiny. And the best way to do that is to own your own business. And through that, you're actually supplying abundance for your employees. You're providing um, economic stability and economic support for your community. Sharon, I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas in uh, 1962, so all my grandparents and all my friends' grandparents, they were all Depression-era babies, and even when they had bank, I mean, I mean, my boys, I mean, th when their grandpa had $3 million in the bank, he still couldn't eat at a steakhouse because he'd be sitting there the whole time thinking, well, this steak, you know, we could have bought this at the store for $1.19. Why are we paying 19 and we're And we're just looking like, holy moly. And they never spent a dime. And and we the baby boomers loosen up a little bit. But I look at the millennials, and I know they're going to get mad at me for this, but I cannot believe the obnox obnoxious family. I mean, I got more money than they'll have than they have by far. And I drive a 2004 uh, car. I mean, they just their lifestyle. I mean, they they always eat out. They they come out of dental school and buy. 
forty five thousand dollar you know BMWs and and t talk about how much your personal spending how that affects uh, your financial business and your your long term plan plan. Well, you can live below your means or you can live above your means, but the issue is let's expand your means to live the life you want. Put off buying that expensive car until you have a successful practice generating the revenue to pay for the car. I always say let's build the asset first and let the asset cash flow pay for the luxuries in life. And unfortunately, the younger generation, not just them, there's a lot of baby boomers that have it flipped too, where they, you know, they, they're living the life, right? They're, li they're kind of putting their head in the sand about their future and they're, just, they're in this spin craziness. And the, the correction comes, and it, it, it's, it's pretty bitter when you, at the end of the month, you have no money left, but you still have bills to pay. And it's an uncomfortable position to be in. And certainly, you know, the younger generation, if they understood the importance of their credit rating, you know, they certainly understood their report cards in school. I said, well, once you get out of school, your credit score is your report card. Your financial statements are your report card. And if you get yourself so heavily in debt, there's never the opportunity to build assets. And so part of it is that wake up call is just slapping them in the face, not literally, but figuratively, and getting them to wake up and understand that they are on a collision course and that they will never have financial freedom in their lives if they continue to spin themselves into debt. They say uh, you're on pod podcasting, you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but since you brought up Politics first, you brought up uh, that you're on Bush's committee and you're the mastermind behind Think and Grow Rich. Uh, what did you think of Trump's book, The Art of the Deal? Well, that, actually, was, that was another big legendary book. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, a I, great I, book. I, I don't care what you say about Trump. Um, that was a huge book. What did you think about that book? Well, I actually wrote a book with Trump, um, Why We Want You to Be Rich. That was one of my last books. At the God, Rich I want you to write a book with me because all these books you talk about, I never saw your name on it. Was your name on the Think and Grow Rich? On Think and Grow Rich for Women, yes. I'm the, I'm the, that's my, my name is the, I am the author of Think and Grow Rich for Women. Um, and I was on originally all the Rich Dad books. Now, since I left um, in the last couple of years, he's republished them and it took my name off them, but we won't go there. Um, but the, the, well, he's your neighbor, and he? Doesn't he live in Paradise Valley? What's that? Doesn't he live in Paradise Valley? He, he lives in Phoenix in the Biltmore area. Oh, okay. But um, but so what you so you, you what so what was it like writing a book with Trump and what was the message of that book? T talk about the these that art of the deal. I mean that was a long time ago. Talk about the yeah. book, the art of the deal, and the book you wrote with him. Why you want to be rich? What well, lessons? the art of the, the art of the deal um goes into the strategic thinking of how you make decisions and how you negotiate deals. And you know Donald Trump is a brilliant man. He is you know he is a micromanager. He thinks through everything. He really is, you know, a, a very strategic business thinker. Um, and the Why We Want You to Be Rich, he really wanted to have an association with a Rich Dad brand. So we wrote that book. That was what we released, I think, in January of 06 is what when that released. And um, the but the art of the deal is still is a brilliant book on strategic thinking. So I would recommend anybody. And it's not so much thinking of it as Trump's name, but really that what he shares in the book is really good. What I think was great about that book. I mean, what do you remember? What year the art of the deal came out? Gosh, no, long time. But, ago. I, but I remember the deal. One of the most memorable lines for me says, "You know, I'd buy your house for a billion dollars if the payment was one dollar a month for a billion months." And people don't think like that. Like like their student loans, they think. Man, I graduated three hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they want a pity party. And I said, "You just bought a job where the average dentist makes one hundred and seventy-five thousand a year. That's you didn't even graduate two years debt. America is only has a seventeen trillion dollar economy and a seventeen trillion dollar debt. It's only one year in debt. Japan is two years in debt. And right. so, so do you think Trump would be a good president for the the economy of the United States, or do you or?" Or do you I not will, want to go there? <laughs> I will tell you, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be my first pick, but I will certainly vote for Donald over Hillary. So, And I actually did serve both Obama and Bush, by the way. In the, I was on both sides of it. But I am, I am a Republican, and um, I, I, would not vote for, I would vote for just about anybody before I would vote for Hillary. And why is that? And I certainly, you know, for women who say, I want a women president, well, 
I want the best president. You know, I want somebody that's going to lead this country and make jobs um, available to people so that people can have financial independence. I want to bring back the American dream. You know, it's a little tarnished these days. And Trump, and Trump fact, wouldn't be your first choice, but you think he could do that? Um, I do know that Donald has his team around him. I've been to his office, have all been with him for excess of 25 years, um, so which shows loyalty and longevity. That's always a good thing. And I do know that when he, he, will, he does bring in experts. And so I would trust that he would bring in the experts to help him in, in the areas where he is the weakest. And I think it's important for all of us to understand, you know, even though it's a bit at jeopardy in today's environment politically, our country was based on the Constitution with three separate branches of government. And those three branches of government are supposed to be checks and balances on each other. And it's important that we get back to that establishment and that we get to the point where we are, again, functioning as the country that was once great. And we need to become great again. So seeing his public persona, then knowing him on the inside, you know, a lot of people have a different stage presence, you know. Um, so, so many uh, actors in Hollywood, you meet them in person or comedians or whatever, they're totally different people. Is Trump kind of like that? Does he have one rally stage personality than one business uh, do the deal personality or is he the same guy in, inside and out? Oh, well, I think he just he just turns the dial up when he's on stage. You know, he's he's kind of he's very, you know, he's he he fills the room when he in, enters it. He has that level of charisma and he's also a very big man. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's an individual meeting or, a, you know, he's on stage in front of 10,000 people. He has he has that command presence. And he definitely dials it up when he's on stage, as does mo as do most people. There's no doubt that he has a huge ego. That's no surprise to anybody. And like I said, I was I'm very I'm a little bit surprised that he's gotten as far as he has, but I think it just shows the level of discontent in America. And he's speaking to that. He's a very smart strategist, and um, I I do believe. Um, that if he becomes president, he will bring and surround himself with people who can truly succeed in, in the roles that they're playing. Yeah, it's funny because when I meet a Trump supporter, the first thing I say is, you know, I'm so sick of the Republicans and the Democrats and they can't get anything done. I'm voting for an independent. And then you're like, dude, he's on the Republican ticket. He's not like an H. Ross Pro. <laughs> uh, what, did, what did you think of H. Ross Pro in our lifetime? That was the last kind of Trump. Like, Would you say Perot was like, Trump won. I mean, would you say, I mean, he was the first billionaire businessman to say, I can run this thing better than a bunch of lawyers. Well, and, and I would have, I, mean, I think it's very different because when Perot was running, the country was in a very different position. Um, you know, when we're, we're looking at the fact that, yes, you know, our country is now $19 trillion in debt. And that's just, you know, it's gone from that 17 trillion to 19 trillion in a very short amount of time. And that's when I have the greatest fear. And I think in order to stop that, it's not the lawyers we can depend on, as you talked about. We need business people. We need business people who understand economics to be able to say, how can we get our economy going again? Not prop it up falsely, but to truly you know, ignite the economy so that we are creating opportunities. You know, our, we're, our capitalistic society is broken. We need to get back to, I often say, our country was built on free people exercising free speech in a free market running free enterprise. And all four of those freedoms are at risk today. And unless we go back to our basics, what's in our Bill of Rights in and in the Constitution, um, we're, we're, we're risking those freedoms. Sharon, do you ever get scared to stay up late at night in bed wondering, you know, I got my MBA at Arizona State University, and some of those economic professors talk, you know, they talk about a stock market bubble and it pops and a real, real estate bubble and it pops. But they say the, uh, the 20 rich countries floating $40 trillion of public government debt is the biggest financial bubble that's ever been created in the history of humanity and it dwarfs any stock market bubble or anything. Do you ever worry someday that that big old government debt bubble is going to pop? Well, there, bubbles are popping all the time. 
The issue is, are you preparing yourself to survive that bubble? Yes, there's going to be a huge bubble that's going to break in our stock market in 2016 or 2017 because you it's see, time. You believe that's that? That's what happens. There's ups and downs. And um, positioning yourself to not be destroyed by it is a smart move. But at this point, you know, our gov the governments are – What's happening at the government level around the globe is very worrisome. It's very scary. But as I said before, you and I can't control that. So, yeah, we can have sleepless nights. We can tear ourselves up emotionally, which becomes tearing ourselves up physically. But let's focus on what we can control. You and I can control what's in our wallet. And, you know, if you're an employee, it's not what you do for your money. It's what you do with your money that determines your financial success. And again, are you a master of your money or a slave to it? So stop worrying about what's happening in Japan. Understand that it's going to impact us. But the greatest way to, to, to insulate yourself is to pay attention to what you're doing with your money and building a stable of financial foundation that is going to allow you to withstand those bubbles. So did I hear – But you, so you're worried. You, you think that the short-term economic uh... – Outlook is very poor. You're, you're afraid some of this. I do not. I do, I do not expect to see the stock market increasing tremendously this year. I think it's going to have another correction. You know what? It always does. It goes up and down, right? Over our lifetime, there's been several major busts, and the issue is, you know, where are you putting your money? You know, if you have money that you have in the stock market, make sure you're paying attention to it and you're reevaluating how it, it goes with your risk. I'm going to be actually launching on my website in the next few weeks a, a free calculator that allows you to say, ask, you know, answer a few questions, and it's going to say, if based on what you've answered, this is the kind of risk allocation you should be looking at on your investments. And people just need to start paying attention to their own their own money. You know, so many of us just send it away to a fund or to a, per, a financial advisor without holding them accountable and so saying, well, where am I financially? What kind of risk do I have? How much is in equities? How much is, you know, where is it? And do you have real estate? Do you, you know, when the, when the crash happened in 08, that was the time to start buying real estate at the bottom. You know, looking at the monies, once you have real estate, that's assets. We talk about assets. Diversification is not among paper it's among all asset classes real estate businesses paper assets intellectual property your podcast is your intellectual property and so understanding having diversification against all of those gives you the best resilience and the best insurance against something going bad on the global economy well you know um dental town website has 210,000 dentists um you should uh uh, it has 51 categories, root canals, fillings, crowns, whatever, but one of the categories is finance. And if you ever have time, I know you're a busy, busy person, but you can log on to, you can become a member of Dentaltown and uh, put your financial calculator on there and links back to your website or, or whatever, because uh, um, I can't believe, uh, I can't believe I scored you for a podcast that is just truly amazing. Usually our podcasts are boring old dentists talking about root canals and implants and fillings and crowns and infection. <laughs> uh, Sharon, uh, it was just an honor uh, for you to validate our show and come on and share your infinite wisdom. I hope everyone listening gets a Think and Grow Rich for Women, Outwitting the Devil, Three Feet from Gold, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Sharon, you're a legend in uh, my mind, in Emily Latron's mind, and so many people. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. Well, it's been my absolute pleasure, Howard, and I would love to. I have a, an ebook called You and Your Money. I'd be happy to give to your team. We'll send you, we'll give you the link that you can um, uh, do it, or they can text me at 55678. Sharon, just text the word Sharon, my name, to 55678. It's called You and Your Money. It's about 100 pages of all aspects of money, um, not only, only just retirement and spending plans, budgets, but how to talk to your kids about money, little kids, teens, adult children, how to have that money talk with your spouse or future spouse. And so it, it talks about insurance. So it's really, it's like the money Bible. And I'd be happy to give it to all of your people. So if you're listening to this on your iPhone, you just uh, text Sharon to uh, just 55678. Five, yep. No pound sign or anything? Just nope, nope. Five, five, Sharon, six, 
I thought that was so neat whenever there's a tragedy and the, and the American Red Cross made it so easy, you know, when there's a hurricane, an earthquake, whatever, and they're on TV and, and they say that. It's just so easy. You just pick up your phone and hit the numbers. Uh, that, that is a, an interesting technology. Uh, Ryan, we need to put that in the, in the show notes. And uh, okay, Sharon, thank you again so much. Well, it's been my absolute honor and pleasure. And thank you for what you're doing for those 210,000 dentists because it's important to work on your business and to find the right mentors. And Howard, you obviously are the right mentor for them. So thank you. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you, Sharon. Bye-bye. Bye.